Um, my name is Kirk Savage. I have been um, studying and thinking about public monuments and memorials um, for longer than I care to remember. Um, and I'm therefore very happy to be moderating a um, panel of professionals who actually design and make monuments and memorial spaces. Um, we have talked a lot um, at this conference, I think, about how to engage publics in the um, work of history and in the work of memory. We've talked about the different roles of scholarship um, on the one hand and what we might call on the other hand the imaginative and effective and sensory work of novelists, um, performers, curators, and so on. I think this distinction though, um, to my mind, the distinction ultimately breaks down because even the simplest Pub, uh, simplest historical narrative, um, I believe, is ultimately an act of the imagination, even if it is an imagination that's been impoverished in various ways. So um, instead of asking how is public history an act of imagination, I'd like to flip the question around in this session and ask um, instead how is the imaginary, imaginative work of architects and landscape architects, an act of public history. And I think that we're in, a, in an ideal position in this panel to maybe begin to address um, that question. So I'd like to start by introducing the, th um, the three panelists that we have today. And I'm gonna introduce them all in a row here from up uh, at the podium, and then they'll come and speak at the podium. We'll all sit in the front here and gather afterwards for discussion. So our first speaker today is going to be Rodney Leon, who trained at Pratt and Yale and founded his own firm, Rodney Leon Architects, in New York. His career has focused on culturally contextual design, especially in public spaces. Uh, some of his recent projects include a master plan for the Museum of Contemporary African and Diaspora Arts, uh, MOCADA, is that, is that what it's referred to, in uh, Brooklyn, New York and um, a sustainable housing development in Haiti. He is best known as the designer of the African Burial Ground Memorial in uh, Lower Manhattan, which we heard about uh, this morning, which is a commemorative, both a commemorative and a spiritual space designed for, and I'm quoting here, acknowledgement, contemplation, meditation, reflection, healing, education, and prayer. Uh, in the memorial field, his most recent honor is winning a large international design competition sponsored by the United Nations for a memorial to the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade uh, located on the UN Plaza in New York. His winning project, the Ark of Return, was unveiled there uh, just last year in 2015. Uh, Sarah Zoidi is a designer working with the landscape architecture firm of Gustafson Guthrie Nickel, based in Seattle. Uh, she trained in landscape architecture at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design and also received a Master's of City Planning from MIT. She's received numerous awards and fellowships, and for several years she has spearheaded the design effort for a very complex and politically difficult project uh, in Rio de Janeiro, working with the mayor's office and um, a local Afro-Brazilian community to create a circuit of African heritage in the city's downtown, which we'll be hearing a lot more about, I think. Uh, and finally, we are um, very happy to have Pascal Bertolo, who is an architect based in Guadeloupe. He trained and worked initially in Paris uh, before returning to Guadeloupe and forming uh, the firm Bertolo Mocha Celestine in 1992. He and his firm have done uh, work master planning, uh, housing projects, and various design competitions and public commissions across the French Caribbean. In 2007, he and his team won the competition for the design and implementation of the Memorial Act, which we've also heard about at the conference uh, and were introduced to yesterday. He was the main coordinator of the project, which was completed in 2015. Uh, along with 10 other firms that he uh, was working with. He's also passionate about jazz and is the general secretary 
of the Cocoon Jazz Club, uh, recently created in Guadalupe. All right, so without any further ado, we'll have um, Rodney come up to the stage, and I look forward to hearing more. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited about being here. Unfortunately, they only gave us 10 minutes, so I'm going to try to read and at the same time pace myself through the slides uh, because I wanted to um, both present both the Ark of Return and the African Burial Ground Memorial as part of the presentation today, uh, but talk a little bit uh, more specifically about process and conceptual frameworks for how we approach the, the projects themselves. So you bear with me, I'll see if I can get this light turned on. Much of my academic and professional career has been engaged in a process of attempting to understand how culture helps to form the basis of my modern identity, and in doing so, searching for formal architectural language expresses of this belief. The design of memorials in urban spaces are a unique and ideal typology through which to explore these ideas. Through memorialization, it becomes obvious that culture and history are two of the most powerful catalysts in the evolution of our collective identity and memory. However, prior, prior to instilling and initiating the formal process, the design, it is important to establish specific goals and objectives as a kind of a manifesto. Architecture of memorialization must communicate and educate. As a timeless teacher, the architecture of memorialization must communicate history for generations to come. We also believe that a memorial must have a significant and a powerful urban presence, especially in the context of the large buildings when you're dealing with urban environments, which can often overwhelm the significance and the sensitivity and the significance of a smaller project. The form, function, and ritual behind the elements also constituting a design should be inspired or derived from precedents or concepts of historical and cultural relevance. The design must also utilize recognizable iconography and images that are symbolically transformed in order to identify the site universally in people's minds. We believe that memorial sites must also be a place of pilgrimage, designed as sacred sites and the memorial a sacred object, dealing with the issues of death, loss, tragedy, and triumph. Its design shall be a place of collective acknowledgement and reflection. It must speak to all people. <clears throat> its beauty, meaning, and power should be expressed in a formal language that transcends differences. Through the expression of ritual, visitors can become active participants through verbal and physical action and movement. One should be able to see, touch, feel, and even listen as part of the experience. For the Ark of Return, which is our design for the United Nations Permanent Memorial to the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade, Three distinct phrases were established as a theme for the competition. Acknowledge the tragedy, consider the legacy, lest we forget. These are three multiple points of inspiration, and the Ark of Return is organized around this three-part theme. The primary formal element used is the triangle, which re references the triangular <coughs> slave trade, the maps of the slave trade, which show the exchange of human beings and the routes taken during the mid middle passage are shown here. The triangles come together eventually collectively to form a shape reminiscent of a vessel or a ship, meant to acknowledge the fact that it was the physical ships that transported millions of African people to the Western Hemisphere. We are also ins were inspired by the door of no return at the House of Slaves in Gori Island off the coast of Dakar in Senegal, which I recently visited. It manifests the reality of people being taken against their will through a door never to return. As a counterpoint to that, the Ark of Return proposes a spiritual vessel and a sacred space that psychologically and ritualistically is meant to transport visitors and ancestral spirits to a place where the historic tragedy can be transcended through acknowledgement and reflection so that a process of healing can take place. Upon one's arrival at the plaza in the north of the United Nations General Assembly building, one is greeted by the image of a large, glowing, white marble form prominently placed on central axis in the plaza. These are some of the sketches which were form, form the inspiration for the design of the Ark of Return. You can see that in the distance, a triangular window at the side of the monument starts to call out to you and draws one towards the object. On axis with this opening, if you're able to move closer to it, <clears throat> is featured on the interior of the space 
a map of the Western Hemisphere with the African continent prominently featured on this map. It is the first element in acknowledgement of the tragedy. You can kind of sli slightly make it out in the window on the image on the screen. As you kind of are drawn closer, you'll be able to look and see that engraved on are locations of transshipment points where people were known to have been taken to different parts of the world. It depicts the global scale complexity and impact of the triangular slave tra trade in acknowledgement of the tragedy. Through the window, you can also grasp the image of a second element, a full-scale human figure lying horizontally. These elements are meant to entice and pull visitors into and through the space of the memorial. A triangular opening serves as the primary entrance point to this memorial. That illuminated triangular opening is a space that one is invited to pass through, and this illuminated portal is somewhat reflective of a new door of return that becomes the entrance to the Ark of Return. And it's on axis on the north and south and east-west of the plaza. The approach reveals the multiple, multiple interactive elements that exist within the space. You can almost make out the outstretched hand of the Trinity figure, which reinforces the invitation for visitors to seriously consider the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade and the physical conditions endured by millions of African people during the Middle Passage. The figure represents acknowledgement of the men, women, and children who perished and their spiritual return. Once you are within the space, a window also frames a view out to the plaza to the west. An oculus also <clears throat> provides additional light to the interior of the space and frames the view to the sky above. You can make out the, in the, in the sky, the flag of the United Nations. As you pass through the space and view back towards the interior, all the elements themselves are revealed to you. And on the left, you can actually make out the engraved relief of the slave ships that we were inspired by earlier on. After passing through, the final element is a triangular font that points us towards and forward into the future as a reminder for visitors to stay vigilant, <coughs> lest we forget. <clears throat> in the second project, it was in May 1991, while the United States General Services Administration was preparing to build a federal office tower in Broadway between Duane and Reed Streets when the first human remains of the 18th century African burial ground memorial were accidentally, African burial ground, excuse me, were accidentally uncovered. The discovery of the burial ground called into question the conventional history that slavery in the United States was primarily a southern institution. The presence of the burial ground brings light to the fact that New York City was not only a major slave port, but at one time the second largest enslaved population in colonial America in the 1700s. During that time, African descendants comprised between 14 and 21 percent of the city's population. And the burial ground is widely considered one of America's most significant archaeological finds of the 20th century. And in 1993, the burial ground was designated a National Historic Landmark. The design for the burial ground was conceived as an ancestral libation chamber. And the visitor's experience is expressed through the multiple mediums of expression. These mediums of expression of form, space, symbol, image, text, ritual, and memory are also communicated through seven component elements incorporated to the memorial's design. On October 4th, 2003, the remains of 419 exhumed African descendants were ceremonially reinterred in separate hand-carved wooden coffins from Ghana. The zone of ancestral reinterment is marked by seven burial mounds that acknowledge the sacred nature of this area located along the entrance plaza to the memorial site. On the north wall, facing Duane Street, surrounded by a series of large government buildings, we also established a wall of remembrance. This wall of remembrance with texts incorporating the phrases, for all those who were lost, for all those who were stolen, for all those who were left behind, and for all those who are not forgotten, are also framed adjacent to an adinkra symbol of Sankofa, prominently featured adjacent to that. On the southern wall of the ancestral chamber, we have established a memorial wall, inscribed with a map that serves to clarify the extent of the 18th century burial ground's actual size. 
This historic map or a historic map is superimposed upon the existing city grid to reveal the true scale of the hidden four acre national monument site, which is significantly larger than the exposed one quarter acre, acre memorial site. The form of the ancestral chamber is a synthesis of traditional and monumental African archetypes representing the soaring African spirit, embracing and comforting all those who enter. One enters the ancestral chamber through the door of return. The ancestral chamber is a vessel that serves to take us back to an original place where we all began. The interior of the ancestral chamber provides a sacred space for individual contemplation, reflection, meditation, prayer, and healing. It is open to the sky and to the lower level court providing a transitional zone between the more secular space above and the more sacred space below. The circle of the diaspora, comprised of signs, symbols, and images engraved around the perimeter wall encircling the libation court. And these symbols come from different parts of the African diaspora. The symbolic meaning is described below each of these symbols and each of these images. As one circulates around the perimeter of the court and spirals down the processional ramp, these symbols present themselves as a reminder of the complexity and diversity of African culture's manifestations. The spiral processional ramp <coughs> itself descends down four feet below street level, thereby bringing the visitor physically, psychologically, and spiritually closer to the ancestors and the original reinterment level. The libation court, which is a communal gathering space, where small to medium scale public cultural ceremonies can occur <clears throat> is the last element. Inscribed on the surface of the libation court is a map suggested of the migration of culture from Africa to Europe, to North America, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. This spiritual space is where reconsecration of the African burial ground site will continually take place during libation or other ceremonial rituals. The ritual of libation is an act which will serve as an offering and acknowledgement linking past, present, and future generations in the spirit of Sankofa. The last slide is a slide of Citadel La Ferrier, which is a fortress constructed in the 18th century in Haiti by the Haitians after their liberation from France in 1804. And that particular construction I think of as um, in some ways, now that it's not functioning, is kind of like a, a, a monument and a memorial at the same time in itself to slavery that um, really also is a monument to resistance. So I, I wanted to put that up there because I think that we often think of uh, memorials as something that we can construct, but we don't often look back in, at our past and look back at things that were done and try to transform them into something that can be used for the future um, in terms of communicating the, uh, the significance of the history of the past. So um, that being said, I think my time is up. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. So architecture, like many of your own fields, is a practice that is bound by the limits of its cultural assumptions. The memorial is an example of a typology of design whose genealogy is bounded by um, particular spatial traditions, namely um, those associated with stillness, silence, and a scale that overwhelms the human body. Um, my work in general focuses on how spatial culture can be used as a creative departure to expand traditions of design. Ucais do Valongo, the Valongo port in Rio de Janeiro, depicted here in a painting entitled Gizimbarque, or Arrival. An estimated 22% of all Africans brought to the Americas via the transatlantic slave trade passed through Rio de Janeiro. And this was the point of arrival for millions of them. As slavery would become more lucrative, investors upgraded this um, wooden deck to a stone jetty in 1811, which ended up being a good investment as in only the first 20 years of that upgrade, over one million Africans walked across the stones. This is an image taken of the bay um, the year before the slave trade was officially made illegal in 1888. Um, so keep this image in your head when we go to the next slide. That image is taken from this hill looking over what was, at the time, water. Um, this is the slave port, and this was the historic coastline. So since that time, there have been a number of um, landfill operations, and today, the coastline is here. So this removed the slave port from view um, as the city was built atop it. 
until 2011, when construction workers uncovered the ruins of the stone jetty, surprisingly pre well preserved below the street. In response to the outcries of activists, the mayor told newspapers the city would, quote, design a memorial that would represent the black experience. Um, that year, I received a grant to research this story, and the activists I was interviewing put me in contact with the mayor's office, where I was able to ask the question, what the hell does it mean to design the black experience? Um, basically, they were like, we are open to ideas. Um, could you design it? So over the last five years, I've continued to work um, with the city on design development of this site and the neighborhood known as Picana Africa. I'd actually like to take a moment to recognize the folks from the city hall. They came from Rio de Janeiro, Washington, and Alini. Can we give them a quick hand? <laughs> for coming on this journey with me. Um, going into this project, I know that I knew what the mayor's office had in mind. Um, the typology of the memorial is rooted in the notion of monumentality of ancient Roman and Greek empires. They're fashioned around the notion of an event, a war, a hero, a triumph, a tragedy, to trigger emotions outside of the everyday. Even memorials that speak to slavery tend to co-opt the language of monumentality, leaving unresolved the fact that slavery was not an event. It was 400 years of the way the world operated its effects still present today. This should suggest a break in a formal language. So my entry point was to reflect on how many tr African traditions of philosophy, art, and space are rooted in a circular notion of time and memory. So looking back some 300 million years, we see that the slave war of the Kaiju de Valongo actually was connected to the southwest coast of Africa. Um, to this day, these lands share the same soil type and floristic characteristics. So on this map, um, you see the slave trade routes in light gray, and you see the sh shared soil region, this lattice red soil, um, and their relationship to the different, these are the different um, basically Afro-American traditions, um, and their relationship to the soil. You also see on top um, the ocean, dominant ocean vectors. Some of these plants, so, so Africans actively brought a lot of the plants um, with them on the ships and were able to um, establish them in the new world. Lar a lot of times in Brazil, the plants actually flourished and people were able to reconstitute their traditions, their plant-based rituals. Um, but in some cases, the ocean vectors actually um, brought with them some of those plants and those plants established themselves before the Africans arrived um, due to their flotation devices. So, when the Africans arrived and they saw some of the species um, that they recognized, it said that that's when they knew that their, their gods were present. So zooming in on this dot, this dot right here is the Caixa de Valongo. And this would have been the view um, arriving in the port, where um, some of the first glimpses of the vegetation and the red soils um, would have been. And you see the stone jetty of the Caixa de Valongo there. So, if you were sick on arrival upon entering the, the stone jetty, you were taken down this street where there was a slave hospital um, in order to heal you and get a better price before your purchase. Um, if you didn't make it or you were dead on arrival, you were thrown in this burial open burial ground here. But most likely what happened is you, upon arrival, were taken down this central corridor in this triangular plaza there known as the deposit where for two to three weeks, um, you went through a period of taming and fattening, during which time you were stored in the many, one of the many warehouses um, that line the streets until the time of your sale. Um, and those sales often took form in the small plazas and open spaces around the city. So I took that historic analysis, which you see at the bottom here, and linked that to the contemporary city grid and found that a lot of these spaces actually still exist with no sign of their history. Um, so looking at the mayor's redevelopment plan in the area, there, are, there were, I identified a number of parcels where our intervention could um, expand to include. Um, I also used the form of the diagram to explore the, the spatial cultures of, um, in the neighborhood that are largely based in Afro-Brazilian tradition, um, and I use this as a method of communicating with community members about how I was interpreting what I was seeing. Um, I'll 
give you an example of, of one of these. Um, so what we're looking at here is an animated diagram of looking at how bodies um, take over urban spaces in the practice of capoeira, an Afro-Brazilian martial art. Um, while the assignment you know, was to design a memorial, this sort of um, analysis made clear that the memory was really embodied in the use of these spaces, and that any approach to design should really be about um, supporting what is already an act of design in and of itself, and it is this sort of ritualistic um, use and, and carving the space over time with life. So, I designed not a discrete memorial, but what you see here. Somewhat of a large strategic master plan um, of a series of designs that are interwoven in the everyday space of the city, um, resulting in eight concrete designs that the city could include in their redevelopment plan. Um, each one of these using historical vegetation. Uh, a lot of these species are, are not supposed to be planted in public landscapes as they are non-native. Um, however, the notion of plant nativity is defined by which plants were there when the Europeans arrived. So this is an arbitrary moment in the constant migration of plants. Um, having made this point, we were given support that we could continue to pursue our idea. So let's look at a couple of the designs to see how this process hit the ground. We'll start here at the Caix de Valongo itself, the archaeological site. Um, currently, there is an obelisk dedicated to the Empress of Portugal, built with the intent to cover up the site after the end of the trade. Um, community activists pushed to have it moved, or at least moved over, but the city refused, citing the empress, too, was part of history. Um, the community's reaction was, okay, let's design something taller. Um, <laughs> however, the, the approach evolved, our approach evolved, and ended up being, instead, about, instead of using height as a demonstration of power, that we would actually employ Afro-Brazilian spatial language and its own definitions of power to set up a much more powerful um, and profound dialogue. So historical mappings reveal that the extent of the archaeological site is actually much bigger. The wharf is much bigger than the site is today, the archaeological site. Um, so I proposed a, a parcel swap between what uh, this is currently. This is where the hospital, this hospital has its trash receptacle. Um, so I proposed moving it to this vacant property that they currently own um, so that we could expand the site and also make, center this entrance into uh, the favela da Providencia where a number of the descendants of this history currently live. Um, also the ficus genus is um, a genus that was native to both continents and Afro-Brazilians believe that the base of this tree is the place where the ancestors gather. And, and they mark that through a wrapping of white fabric or white walls around the base of the tree. Um, so I explored in plaster the forms that a wrapping um, could suggest. And in design, made this sort of wrap form the circulation system from the favela, from the, this historic street, um, to form the sort of suggestive circular forms for those um, uh, traditions that happen in these in these circular um, typologies, and also link it to this historic building, which um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but is under consideration for a, a National Museum of Afro-Brazilian History and Culture. So um, this is all wrapped in a planting of the ficus trees for shade, but also to mark where the ancestors gathered. Um, so this, you know, as opposed to the sort of box form that the archaeology site normally takes, the wrap sort of smudges the boundary between archaeology and the city, um, between every day, between past, present, and future. So um, let's look at this site here. Um, today, it's, there's kind of a row of underutilized warehouses on the coast. So I propose removing the one that is aligned with what would have been the last few feet of the African journey. Um, there are a number of Afro-Brazilian traditions related to the sea, but the bay is, a, is polluted and dangerous to touch. So the question became, you know, how do we design something to allow those practices to happen here? 
I proposed a plaza with a um, thin half inch scrim of water that would reflect the sky. Um, and you know, it being just above open water kind of gives a sensation of infinity um, and activates Afro-Brazilian traditions, but also gives children in the neighborhood a place to play, um, offers microclimate um, refreshing to uh, urban dwellers in the Brazilian heat. So it's this layering of, of every day and memory. So I'll show one last one. Um, the design for this historic, the historic coastline, which is now a street, um, really came from this idea of, you know, that the street was not only the coastline 100 years ago, but 150 million years ago, it was touching Africa. And so, you know, these are some early sketches of like what could a graphic say about the land masses sort of stretching um, and pulling back together. Um, so I proposed downgrading um, vehicular traffic and privileging one side of the street to allow this sort of seam um, to open up and have enough space for vegetation. Um, th again, the same African vegetation. So the seam is sort of ripping, um, ripping apart and, and the vegetation is, is um, coming through. So this would be using red pavers, again representing the red soils of the two continents. Um, and it's a graphic that can be illuminated and legible from the favelas above. So this is a um, bench design um, that includes the vegetation and also inscriptions that could serve as a motif around the neighborhood. So aggregated, it sort of leads you through the neighborhood, also um, layering the everyday, again, with, with the memory. This is a large-scale model I was working with to understand the relationship between these spaces. Um, here you see the wrap and how it centers the entrance into the favela and the sort of graphic legibility of the, of the historic uh, coastline. So the constellation sort of goes up to the top of the favela from where you can look down and see the plaza with water overlooking the bay. So you know this, this project is sort of territorial, but it does take a lot of different forms. Sometimes it's um, you know, subtle, other times it's not. Um, other times it's just about inscription, other times it, it does more about contextualizing the history around. But it, um, in, every, in every instance, it's really about upholding this idea that the memory actually lives within the spaces, within the uses of the spaces um, that we see every day. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, French architect, but Guadeloupean architect from uh, the Caribbean. And um, so I apologize for my English. And I have uh, Karen De Bruyne with me because uh, he will, she will help me to, to, to do this presentation. So, uh, uh, I'm a representative of uh, four architects who, who work on the, on the competition. It was a competition in Guadeloupe uh, for the Memorial Act. And, uh, and I organized this presentation in two uh, poles, what we found and what we do. What we found is, we are talking about uh, association context, because we have a lot of association um, in, a, in our island, talking about the regional political demand, the geographic place, the town of Pointe Pit, history of the seed program, and cultural and political context of literature. So uh, in, in this uh, project was uh, a demand of the population via the association. And then uh, you have Luc Renet, who was a, a leader she takes the project and, and uh, pull it and, you know, um, and Victor and Lurel, who was the uh, chief of the region, say, okay, um, I understand what you mean, I understand what the population mean, and I'm going to do it. So uh, this card is, you know, the, the blue uh, is a French island in the Caribbean. It's just to say that uh, we are three area and others as are speaking uh, English in red and Spanish in uh, green. So it's difficult for us to exchange, you know, 
literature, to, uh, to talk with uh, our uh, mm, voisins. Neighbors. <laughs> neighbors, because, uh, because we, are, we have not the same language. And that is uh, important to understand the context of assimilation and, and alienation we can have uh, with colonialism when we are alone in this, uh, in this, uh, in this area. So that's the town of Pointe Pit. You have the, the frame, uh, urban frame, colonial with rectangular, and the other part of Pointe Pit was popular with no frame, but it's the port. And uh, our project is on this parcel, on this, uh, on this land. You can see uh, it was, it was, a, it was a, a, um, an usine, a sucrerie. It was a sugar uh, factory? Factory, sugar factory, uh, in, uh, because Darboussier made in, 19, in 1867 uh, on this, um, cette, uh, cette, uh, cette usine est arrêtée en 1980. So the, 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 the factory stopped in 1980, sorry, 1980. 1980. Okay. Um, donc, uh, here are some views of the rest of the usine, of the factory. And this uh, building is going to be uh, rebuilt because it was the famous building of the um, où on faisait la paix des ouvriers. La paix des ouvriers. On payait where, this where we paid the, uh, the workers in this building? Yep. So it was a demand, a social do, uh, demand to keep it on the site. And on the site. So there's a uh, competition requirements. They give us, you know, some, uh, some because they work on it before. The, com the competition were in uh, 2007. In 2007. And we have a program, and then we we overpass the, the the response because it was too small, and to say, oh, we are looking for work uh, to um, in the bay, in the dans la baie. In the bay. Well, in the bay. And uh, we, want, we want cargo, we want uh, boats, uh, tourist boats, see us, so we have to be long, we don't have to be high. So uh, I, I want to talk about uh, our culture because it, it's very important because uh, uh, we're still French. Um, English island can understand uh, what I say because uh, uh, English colonization was a rupture uh, and then um, but uh, um, French colonization is insidious. Insidious. Insidious, you know, because and, uh, we were, uh, instead of uh, 1848, um, 1848, jusqu'à 1946, uh, until, non, de 1848 à 1946, so 1848 to 1946, on était, we were a colony. À partir de 1946 jusqu'à notre jusqu'à aujourd'hui, so from 1946 until today, I think it's we are department. Now we're a department. But uh, nothing has really changed about the power. <laughs> okay, everybody understands that. Okay, <laughs> so uh, in our culture, you know, MSCR say with a cahier d'un retour au pays natal or discourse sur le colonialisme. Okay, um, he says that uh, we have to write our culture and don't write the culture of the, of the colonizer. The colonizer. Yeah, the colonizer. He say, um, he talk about cultural alienation. And he says that uh, after that, we have to open to the world. After that. And Glissant, say, uh, make a lot of on creole, creolity, creolization. Three things, three different things. But uh, we are not to talk about listen today because, but it, it was important for us to approach and uh, to see this approach. And um, it, it was important because in 2001, 2001. <laughs> the French Parliament passed a law declaring slavery a crime against humanity. Then President of the French Republic, Jacques Chirac, asked the writer Edouard Glissant to lead the reflection of the construction of the National Center of the Memory of the Slavery and Their Abolition 
it will be, it was, uh, it, it was supposed to be a building in France. So Edouard Glissant make a book he called Mémoire des Esclavages, and he was describing this, uh, this, uh, this building. And we read that because it was before the competition. That's uh, always what we found. Okay, so after Glissant, we, we, we have uh, read, you know, Franz Fanon. We have read also Patrick Chamoiseau. He make a book, uh, Écrire en pays dominé. So Karen is going to read for you. He writes, how can you write when your imagination is fed from dawn to dreams with images, thoughts, and values that do not belong to you? How can you write when, you are, when what you are vegetates outside of the momentum shaping your own life? How can you write when you are dominated? So that's a crucial question because we are a department, but all, all model, cultural model, are, uh, come from France. So, um, um, Patrick Chamoiseau say, mm, I don't think I'm French. Perhaps I'm American. Perhaps I'm African. Perhaps I'm Indian, Chinese, Syrian, Lebanese. Perhaps I'm colonist. That's all make me Creole. That's what I am. And Christian Tobira, which was minister in, uh, in the government who pays the, the law in, in 2001. 2001. Yep. And uh, Christian uh, Tobira says that um, effectively, we have to be together. We have to, okay, we have a lot of uh, problems, but we have, we don't, we, we cannot make a fragment society. That was important for us to and then what we found, the last one, we found, you know, the Memorial of Nantes. It was uh, made by uh, Bonder, Mr. Bonder, which he, who is here. Yep, say, and what is cool. And uh, you know, they, um, they, they, we know the, the work because they were working with symbol. So Karen is going to. Step by step, the artist lays out his point of view. The term memorial relates to commemoration, which is defined as something that is used to preserve the memory or the knowledge of a person or event, but is also akin to the word memento, which is something used to warn or to remember with a view to influence future events. Okay, it's uh, from a book, uh, book of Emmanuel Cherrel, Le Memorial de l'Abolition de l'Esclavage de Nantes, Enjeux et Controverse. So, uh, we have all of this reflection, and then uh, we say, okay, how are we gonna do it with all, all of that? So in town, the tribute, and speak to the future. In town, you know, we know this place. This place is um, the, the, the yellow place you have here, this one. It is a military place. In all Caribbean, all the place you have are military place because they want, you know, to put um, the, the man in row. Yeah, and places a plaza, so all of those plazas are yes. where they have the military lineup. Yep, to go, you know, to, to go to the mountain, you know, to uh, bring back the uh, people who escaped. Is that? The people who? Qui sont sous son écharpe des gens. That, that escaped. That escaped, escaped. So we say first we are going to make a place the second one in yellow, we are going to make a place who, which is not a, a military place. And the symbol is, okay, that's the first place in our Caribbean that it is not military initiative. And then in composition, we have donc, uh, this one, which is our place. And then you can see the, the building and you have if the place we can uh, Commemoration. So it's the plaza where you do the commemoration. Commemoration. It's under, you know, the, the, the arc, and it is the abut, c'est l'aboutissement de la place. 
And so it's the final step of the of the plaza. So that's uh, some, you know, sketch about uh, the competition was uh, uh, like that. You can see so the building, uh, a bridge, the um, la colline, the hill of the memory in there, and then a proposition of composition of a human uh, frame. So uh, the building, we we read uh, Derek Walcott, who, who told us that. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, I say yesterday we were we were talking about hunger. I think it was yesterday. Yeah. So no hunger to um, to draw, no hunger to propose a, a solution, but uh, but uh, peace and hope. And that uh, we want to try that. You we we see that uh, on the site. It is a um, a building was there. He used to have water in it and rum, but now it's not, uh, it is not on. And uh, we see this, this, this stone, and we see, you know, this, this tree. We are grow up uh, in the stone and, 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 say, and grow up to go to the, to the sun. And they say, okay, that, that's, uh, that's uh, good for us because uh, it is how, uh, our land, it is our culture, it is our uh, vegetation. 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 And, uh, and uh, it can be our symbol. Uh, you have the granite here, and you have a transposition of that vegetation we, uh, to, go to, the, to go to the sky. Uh, and we try, we, 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 we explain that, we say, okay, it silver roots on a black box, uh, roots, okay. We understand that because um, uh, it's a, it's a, it can take, you know, substance in the black box, and the black box uh, is uh, the history of our uh, Caribbean uh, uh, trade and slave. And it is a, a room of uh, 1,700 meters So 1,700 square meters? Yes. Uh, for, uh, uh, where you can see all the history, and we say, when you know this history, you can grow up. When you know this history, you know your history, you can go to the future with it. And that's a message we, c we can say with, uh, with this architecture. So we use symbol. So that's a granite. The granite has some, uh, you know, um, inscript, um, sparkling pieces of gold. Yes, yeah, sparkling sp pieces of gold. You know, and when the sunlight is on, you know, they, they're just blinking and they say, okay, we are there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I say, okay, thank you, uh, you are with us because we go to the future. Okay, so that's uh, some sketch, uh, you know, from, uh, from, uh, from, from the Resille. Um, from the, the Lattice work. The Lattice, yes, the Lattice. And uh, it was like a goal for us. It was we wanted to to have a, a good uh, a good treat a bon treatment. A good treatment of it. Yeah, because you know, the, the it was noble. 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 It was noble for us. It was like the chain for size. You know that that the chain of the savory and uh, and our Caribbean. You know they make it like gold. They make it like uh, um, you know they transform it. Like René Marine say, we gather it and salt and turn, it, turn them into diamond. And that's why, that is why we, we wanted to do with, uh, with this uh, coral. Um, just, you know, to um, show you how, how to make, don't uh, completion, you can see the beginning, transposition, make it, make it on the on walk. Just by, you know, by uh, 20 meters. 20 meters? 20 meters linear, and that we're going to go up. Oh. Voilà. <laughs> and that uh, design, uh, because we have also this problem, uh, you see there, you have the, uh, that is not regular. That's not regular. It, when, when the wind push the facade, it has to be regular because it's an application of a force. The force is, is one. So you can make something regular. You say, oh, I want, uh, the engineer say, I want, I want two meters before the, on, the, on the, the photo. On the pillars? Yes, and, and then you go. But you say, no, we want another ordonnancement. 
another um, organizing or another yep, shape? another organizing. And we base it on the Madras fabric. Because in uh, um, 18, uh, uh, 1848, when uh, the slavery was abolished in Guadeloupe, in uh, 1854, uh, Indians come to the country with contract, you know, because there were nobody on the plantation. But they worked in the same condition. So it's, it's just, you know, a, a clin d'oeil. It's just a, a wink to... Okay. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, it, 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 it was uh, for us, for our culture, because it is now our culture, for the, for the color also, uh, Madras uh, teaches us uh, a lot of things, uh, you know. That's why we, we say we are linked. So after that, we have that it for a first bit because uh, you have uh, so it is, it's a circular. This is a patio. This is the um, la salle de commémoration, la salle de, de La salle de présentation des œuvres, c'est-à-dire l'exposition. Exposition, exposition room. L'exposition. Et ça, c'est l'exposition temporaire. That's the temporary ex exhibition room. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the central patio with the potomitan. We are going to, to talk about that. And uh, you have uh, the bridge. The bridge will go to the hill. The, the bridge is very uh, light because. Uh, he was made by uh, um, a famous architect in France. Uh, his name is Marc Mimram. He was a laureate of the, the, the Gadacan, the Prix Agacan, Prix Agacan, Agacan Prize uh, last year. <coughs> so uh, he worked with us and she does that. So that was, uh, you know, market of um, works in his, uh, in his office in Paris. And that does that, you know, how it is, comment c'est léger. It's very light. Very light, yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, here is, uh, you know, the um, lattice uh, on the sun, you know, the, the work of the sun with the lattice on the bottom of the building. Oops. And uh, we say that we have a lot of high proportion, but it is not like uh, this, bad, this building, because this building was uh, uh, built in uh, 1930 after uh, um, a, a storm, a big storm, uh, an, an ouragan. After a hurricane? Uh, after an hurricane. And the uh, um, French uh, say to Aliture to come in Guadeloupe to say, uh, to, to reconstruct all the, all the administration, um, all the administration building. And they make a, a high proportion, but it was not uh, in, uh, in homage, it was to, you know, to afraid the population, to say, okay, I am, uh, I am l'État. I am the state. I am a state. I am big, I am, I am strong, and uh, you have to learn that I am there. They are the ones that <laughs> Yeah, it's important. So, uh, um, we know, uh, we, 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 we try to, to, um, to, 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 Put it on a different. Um, mm, that's not good. This one is mere. We are talking about symbol. And uh, I, I took uh, this man who stay as a local representation of a pressing of sensorial form because, <coughs> you know, uh, symbol the potomitan. It was a, a symbol of uh, for us of the position of the woman. In, the, in our history. We think that uh, women were the, the potomitan of the family, and, and, uh, and it's, a, it's an homage, it's a tribute. It's a tribute. It's a tribute. Mm -hmm. huh? So it's a sculpture. And, uh, but uh, we did it because uh, uh, potomitan, uh, like, uh, oh, see, see, uh, that's uh, the fabrication. Let's see. Oh, 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 oh. Potomitan for us is, you know, he, he can, you can, you can um, farm potomitan in all the Caribbean. You can find it uh, becoming as a Indian in the, uh, South America because Tainos have a, a kind of potomitan. 
uh, in the in uh, in um, Vodou, you can have uh, in, uh, in the temple la souvenance you have potomitan. Um, it, uh, it represents the Axis Mundi, you know, you can go in it, you can go to sky, you can go to Enfer. To hell. The hell, and you can, uh -huh. <laughs> it's important. Um, and, uh, in Maya world, you have seven levels. In the Potomitan, you have seven levels, okay, you can, you can be God, you can be half God, you can be servant of God, and then you can be human. So, um, in a, in a, um, in Africa, you have, you have a representation of Iroko. Um, it's a very special for... Um, and in Guadeloupe, you have a lot of... Uh, uh, um, Beliefs. Beliefs. They call that les mots foisés, les soucougnants, les volants, you know, some, some spirit who can keep you and take you away. So, uh, and, uh, so... so what I say is, um, that's our culture. It's a culture of the Caribbean. And that's why the Potomitan is what we want in our, in our uh, building. Because I know my population know it. I know Caribbean people know it. And it is, it is uh, a way to federate. To federate? To federate them and to, and to tell them that, OK, the language, the literature, the art, and also the architecture is an expression of our belonging of the Caribbean archipelago. So um, I forgot, because uh, when, I, when I begin, uh, I, I always have, uh, you know, two uh, proverbs. Proverbs. Proverbs in Creole, because I... <laughs> In, uh, in my number, my number déplacement. In my many um, trips that I take. Yeah, yeah. In, in the in the Caribbean, I saw that you always seek somebody who speak Creole. Always in Sh in uh, every island, in uh, English island or in a Spanish island. And uh, the first one is one was tombé piquant levé. That uh, it is a rose falls on torn stay. That his beauty is not eternal. That come from Haiti. And the last one is, Grand Moon say we made. Aged people are medicine. Thank you. <laughs> so my job is to moderate this panel, and um, I'm very conscious of the time that we're already at uh, 3.05. So I think I'm going to, um, again, depart from the protocol, and uh, instead of having 15 minutes of discussion now, I think we're going to open it up uh, right away to the audience. I just wanted to make one point. Just wanted to make one point um, first, which I had originally framed as a question, but I think um, I'll just leave it as an open question that maybe we can return to if there's time, or for you to think about in the audience. Um, and that is, you know, in my work on public monuments, starting um, in the, the kind of golden age of the public monument, the modern period, starting in the 19th century. Most public monuments, the high point of their life was the day that they were finished and opened and unveiled. And from that point on, it was all downhill. Uh, and uh, they rapidly uh, fell into obscurity and even invisibility in the famous quote by Robert Musial that uh, the nature of the monument is to be invisible. So from a public history standpoint, uh, public memorials traditionally have been uh, disasters. <clears throat> and what is so interesting to me about, um, about this group of projects uh, and the work that is being done uh, really in the contemporary period is that, is that you know, monuments have become much more living memorials. And these projects, I, I, I think, uh, exemplify that. And it's something, it's a theme that we've, that we've seen over and over again in this conference, which is you know, once, um, once the, the exhibition is opened or once the website is launched, you know, it's, it's then that actually the work begins again. I think that was a phrase that has returned to me over and over again. The work begins again at that point. And so I'm, I'm very interested in the question of how that is designed. How do we design for that outcome? How do we design spaces and memorials uh, to actually make that work begin again after the monument is open and finished? Um, so I'll leave you with that, and I think we'll, um, we'll go directly 
to the audience, and we have uh, in the back there, yes. I think that's actually a wonderful question. Um, I was thinking about Sarah's work, which is uh, very thoughtful and emerges from an enormously fascinating creative process. I worked with her firm, GGN, on the Boston Greenway, where we ran into extraordinarily interesting opposition, not so much partly from the community, um, but also um, from other architects and landscape architects and designers on some of the Greenway projects, less on the GGN. So I'm wondering what organizational process and, and educational process, to follow on, on Professor Savage's question, gets accompanies the, the design and implementation of this. How do you actually get this politically uh, achieved um, against what is, you know, I mean, other architects, must be hundreds of architects in Rio who think of themselves as being equally capable of this project. And therefore, we know, I mean, we all know that the kind of jealousies that emerge in this. So how do you actually create the organization, the political process? <clears throat> and then, I guess, there are two other issues. One is, the, is, is Professor Savage's question. How does this continue and get sustained? And how does the heuristic quality get expounded? I mean, who, who takes responsibility for uh, you don't want to have signage everywhere that says, here's what the architect thought she was doing. Um, so how does that actually continue to happen 10 years after the opening uh, in a project that's so subtle and so rich and so interestingly derived from different kinds of research? Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, I mean, one, one of the issues in Rio and, you know, I started to also work with a few other communities um, around the United States a lot of the community, the neighborhoods where these sites are located are underserved by, in terms of urban infrastructure. So um, in a way, it's, it's a political um, move, but it's also one about the memorial not fading into obscurity to link it to um, the sort of the urban redevelopment that's already happening. So in Rio, you know, what we'd been doing to this point was really targeting the World Cup and the Olympics um, as an impetus. Um, those events have now passed, and so we're, we're re-strategizing now about what else we can sort of link that to, but all across the United States and the Americas, you're seeing this urban renaissance, this huge major investment in urban infrastructure, um, and a lot of that is happening and putting pressure on these historic sites. We saw the map earlier of all of the ports um, in the United States. All of those, you know, all of those sites are located in the downtown core of these cities, and so, um, as redevelopment is happening, I think politically, it's, it's, um, it opens up an opportunity to, to do something like this. In the case of Rio specifically, um, I, I mean, I'm just like a guerrilla architect, basically. You know, I, I sent a bunch of emails. I asked, you know, the, I get the people that I was interviewing on, it was supposed to be a two-week research project, um, you know, sent enough emails to this man sitting right here, and he responded to one, you know, that was five years ago. And so I, to, to expand that to say that there, there's sort of an organizational model, maybe ask me in another five years. Um, for now, I'm, I'm really, I'm just working um, sort of in this, you know, guerrilla style, um, working with communities that reach out to me um, and, and strategizing from there. But a lot of city officials actually see this, um, there's sort of a paralysis around these sites, you know, um, a lot of them are vacant and being eyed for redevelopment and, um, there's sort of a reaction to not do anything because they're sacred sites, but at the same time, there's, there's sort of a checkmate because there's no movement for something else, and so um, I think there's an opportunity there. Um, can, I, uh, <coughs> can I follow up on that? Um, so I actually wanted to, to um, give a shout out and, and a moment to someone in the audience here who was actually mentioned in Pascal's talk who is... Um, Julian Bonder, now that I've located you in the audience, <laughs> I couldn't see where you were with the lights. Um, <clears throat> Julian Bonder, who is the co-designer with Christophe uh, Vodishko of the Memorial to the Abolition of Slavery in uh, France, which is located in Nantes, uh, and uh, was mentioned as one of the inspirations for the Guadeloupe project uh, there. And I, I thought, since we have you in the audience and uh, um, we have the good fortune to have uh, Julian here in the audience with us today that maybe you could uh, 
give us um, a reflection or two on the panel and, and perhaps a question as well. And then, and then I'll be happy to open it up to the, the rest of the audience. <clears throat> Thanks so much for, for the invitation to, to, to make a couple of comments. And I want to thank for the three presentations and, uh, and the, the conference in general. I think it's extremely powerful work uh, at many levels, from the symbolic level, from the kind of uh, questions of meaning, uh, questions of how communities relate to place. Uh, and I think uh, what is quite interesting is that, that uh, all three presentations uh, have what we could call different approaches to the language you know, of making things. Uh, more ephemeral, more present, uh, more charged with symbols that come from different places. So I think it's extremely powerful to see this work you know, from, from vantage point of a practicing architect and, and also a professor that are working on history of Rhode Island slavery. So there's a lot of things that, that, uh, that strike me as quite interesting here in, in the conference in general. Maybe, maybe I can make a couple of comments and, 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 and ask a question then. One is, uh, as what Pascal kindly mentioned, you know, some of our writings and our work on the notion of memory and memorial. I mentioned yesterday that for me, memory is not an object. Memory is a verb. It's an, it's an action to remember. Uh, and the word monument comes from the word monere. And it means to warn, to remind, and to advise. So it's not a question of scale or dimension, you know, it's more like, what is monumentality? It's the capacity that places have in our minds to evoke or make us think of something beyond themselves. And to me, this is what, what, inter what is interesting about all this work, is that, yes, we're working with matter, but we're trying to evoke something beyond matter. You know, yes, we're working with space, but we're trying to evoke something beyond space, which is the capoeira <coughs> moment, you know, or, or the burial itself, or, you know, or the moment of, you know, of of, of symbolic nature that, that Pascal mentioned. So to me, the, the question here is, uh, how do we, you know, when we work on this project, which is, Kirk, what you were asking, I think, I think we have to be mindful and be wary of expectation of creating instant metaphors and somehow artificial meanings. It's a, it's a risk that we all have, mm -hmm. all the time. So how do we position ourselves in relation to our own understanding of the word metaphor, and how do we relay that to the public? You know, is the public going to receive an explanation? I think as was asked before, you know, uh, well, maybe yes or maybe it's not necessary. So for me, the question is, how do we uh, accept our role as public intellectuals, you know, and embrace our role as public intellectuals so that we can transform in a certain way public sphere, you know, the public sphere as a place for dialogue, as was talked about before in the diocese project, you know, for, for the Center for Reconciliation, or the spaces in Rio, or the spaces in Nantes. So that requires a commitment to me, and this is the question, uh, how do we address something that is extremely complex, which is those others who do not have a voice, or, or did not have a voice? Uh, can we hear the echoes of the past? In many of, our, in many of your work, we can somehow sense it, and it's extremely powerful to see it. Uh, but still remains kind of a big question, because if we think of all these projects as politically motivated, and as, which are all political, you know, then we need to understand what is politics in relation to visibility. Hannah Arendt told us that political equality relates to visibility. Conversely, inequality relates to invisibility. So while we strive to make visible places or make visible things, we still have to think about why is it that visibility is so important to us in our culture that is based on the gaze, on what we see. So what I would like, if the panel could reflect us in this question of why is it that, I mean, perhaps you have thought of this, but why is it that the visible is so important, and how do you address, which you ex explained a little bit, that which is not visible in your work? Thank you very much. Yeah, I could um, maybe respond to that question. One of the things that um, I tried to think about is this idea of context, 
and um, you know, as an architect and as a, as a student while studying architecture, uh, particularly in urban environments, uh, you know, we, there was always a reinforcing of this notion and this idea of, of context and the importance of context and, react, and reacting to context. And for, for myself, as, uh, and I'm sure for a lot of us as designers, uh, there's, there's a certain degree of like potentially resistance to context it's insofar as, you know, where does the, where do you fit within the context that you're given? And how do you begin to develop ideas or represent ideas relative and, you know, really an extension of yourself if you are constantly deferring to something that came before you? Uh, that's a particular challenge in regards to, um, let's say, if you're coming from, let's say, African American perspective, where you're trying to establish context within a larger context, and and an extension of that, then becoming like establishing relevance, <coughs> right, and becoming visible. So you know, I always had a problem or a challenge in terms of like how do I approach context because I think that contextuality can be considered uh, in a multi in a myriad of ways. Uh, as opposed to the say physical context, there's also the intangible element of context, which I think you're talking about, which deal with like history, uh, deal with memory, deal with even how spaces are used and occupied that give them relevance that are just as relevant as physical context, and sometimes even more relevant. Uh, and I think in the process of designing spaces, especially like memorial spaces, what we're looking for, what I look for in, for context. Uh, in order to uh, reveal what has been concealed are these intangible elements of context that deal with like history and deal with um, culture. And, and for me that becomes integrated as part of my process to establish uh, a voice that can then transform and become more integrated into a larger fabric of context and, and then you know, become visible. So we have, um, we have a couple of questions from our institutional sponsors. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> three now. <laughs> so, uh, so, Paul I'll, was the first. I'll be uh, brief because I think some, some of this, uh, I'll leave aside your question of, of memory. I thought, I, Sarah, I thought you had a beautiful response to that in your comments that were, you know, memory lives in the uses of the spaces we see every day. And I think that speaks directly to Kirk's original question. But I have this question now about, I think, inspiration and visibility. And I, and I thank you three for very powerful projects and presentations. It's beautiful <coughs> to see. Um, Sarah, I guess my question is directed toward you, because I, was, I too, was impressed by the variety of sources, especially um, the work that on the maps you were showing. Uh, on that we're, and that we're talking about the transportation of vegetation over millions of years. I thought that was fascinating. I wondered if you also had begun, if, if any of your research process utilized looking at some of the materials that were excavated from Bolongo. I know that, that it, um, that there were materials uh, excavated that were produced on the site by women who were creating bracelets uh, that, were, that were then given to people for protection in those sites throughout the city. Uh, simple bracelets made of, uh, of utilitarian materials. And that to me um, is a very powerful thought I didn't know if you had, if you were beginning to work with any of the symbols or objects of, of from, from those who were uh, enslaved uh, on that site. And then I think this, my second question gets into this question of visibility and making something visible, um, and whether or not you could speak to, because I think you spoke about the politics and the economics of revitalization and what this meant and what, and what it means to make this history visible. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about this project in context of the revitalization of the Puerto Maravilla and what that, and, 
and maybe explain that a little bit um, and what <coughs> it means as a, as a very different successful revitalization project in the same space that speaks to a, a different kind of history and future perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> those are great questions. Um, you know, and the question of vis the question of visibility, it's an interesting topic to me um, because a, a lot of the things that we're talking about and, and it very much underpins the approach to the design is that these things are already visible. It's a question of whether we're choosing to see them or not. Um, and so the approach to design is maybe highlighting of something <laughs> that's already there um, and to validate that existence, but these things are these things are open air and visible. Um, so you know, with regards to um, sort of um, getting inspiration from the actual objects excavated, um, so that whole circuit of African heritage incorporates um, what's called the Urban Archaeology Lab, which I, I'm actually going to ask Washington to take the mic to explain this initiative. But my, my, my role as a designer has been to, um, with, with regards to that specifically, is to incorporate um, the already existing plans to create an open ar urban archaeology lab. So they haven't necessarily been a point of departure for, in terms of design, formalistically speaking, but they are incorporated in the programming um, of, of the circuit itself. Washington, do you want to add anything about the process? He can also speak more to the politics um, and the Porto Maravilha project. Um, you know, Porto Maravilha, as I understand it, was really um, constructed around the idea of the Olympics, but a lot of the infrastructure is still um, in plans to be, continued to be um, implemented and developed over time. And so, you know, we really see this effort continuing beyond the Olympics. Um, Porto Maravilha also sort of laid the groundwork for understanding the, the or setting the setting the standard for the scale of intervention that we could describe. You know, it's such an ambitious infrastructure development project that why can't we also be ambitious about the way that we're approaching this design work? You know, um, and so it's really kind of writing the coattails of that project. Um, at the same time, it's pretty clear that um, a lot of the aspects of the plan that have to do with, you know, um, developments for large companies, you know, private development, all the private development is obviously very, um, running on a much faster pace than our project, um, so that can be frustrating at times. But at the same time, I, I see it, it's been tremendously beneficial in terms of operationalizing the scale um, of, of our effort and, and understanding that we really can make a difference, you know. Um, if, if all of this is going to be dug up and repaved, why don't we do it in a way and replant it? You know, why don't we do it in this other way? You're, you're, we already have the financing, you know, you already have the space. This, this place is, is, is relevant for these particular reasons, you know. In a lot of ways, we actually developed a chart um, showing that what our design was is actually, you know, more cost effective than what they, had, they were designing originally. Um, you know, a lot of it is also politics and politics that, frankly, as a designer, um, I don't really understand the depths of, um, but I can, let the, I can let the politician in the room speak to that. <laughs> That's why he came here. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, um, Sorry about my English. Uh, I'm not a politician, and I'm an architect and urban planner too. I'm in charge of the heritage of the city of Rio. And what is happening in the, the waterfront of, of Rio, it's, uh, it's the, the common type of uh, urban regeneration happen in waterfronts in other parts of the world. But we got uh, this very special place in Rio, which is uh, the Valongo Wharf. And which is also the, the, the presence of uh, 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 descendants of African Brazilian uh, population in the port area. So basically we, we, what we, uh, we are trying to do, what we try to do is uh, how to use our heritage power as a possibility to bring more visibility to this local community and from inside of the, the city hall, try to, to bring to the light this, uh, this very traditional route and also this very powerful culture that we got in the port area of Rio. So, 
I used to say that we got uh, Norman Foster buildings in, in Rio now, we got Calatrava buildings, uh, we got trans, we got a lot of public space, uh, like every part in the world, but we only in Rio we got the Valongo Wharf. So that means that this uniqueness of this place, it's the most powerful thing. And so we try to use our work and our privilege as heritage to deal with that. And it was uh, a, a very good collaboration with Sara, and Sara uh, bring to us this very provocative idea of the Spangia uh, uh, connection of the, the South America continent connect with the African continent. And that create a, uh, some very interesting uh, uh, aspects to our work. I would like to give one example about the baobab. Uh, Sarah proposed to plant the baobab tree in, the, in Rio, and this is not uh, allowed anymore because baobab is not a native tree from Brazil. So that means that it's illegal to plant a baobab tree. And we have to fight with this kind of regulations and laws about uh, botanic uh, uh, regulations. So sometimes in the public sector, to do something important, you have to do something legal. <laughs> and sometimes in the public sector, innovation, it's quite a little bit close of illegal. And so now we got the, the bow battery finally in the, the, in, in the place. And that was a very important for the, the local community. This is a, one of very small example about the, the challenge that we had to manage. What we discuss a lot, Sara, with our team, it's about uh, the, the challenge of the public space and how to bring to the public space the cultural and symbolic signals connect with African-Brazilian culture. And we understand that as an American challenge, too, because in Brazil, the, the black population, or it's, it's segregated in, in the cities. And we understand that the public space had a special role to create access to, not necessarily access to the city, but access to the public sphere. So we understand that the public space, it's our so uh, 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 it's our challenge in, the, in Port of Rio. So uh, we discussed that with Sara. We don't want a memorial. We want a new type of character for the public space. And then understanding that we got this public space, which still now got the symbols and the character of the white culture. But how could be possible in that place, in such important historic place, with such important heritage, we don't have a, a, a codice that could represent, represent the African-Brazilian culture. And we understand that this is a type of challenge that we have to face it. And we have to, to, to deal with that because we understand that there's a lot of connection with the, the presence till now about violence in cities, violence against black population, violence against against uh, uh, youth uh, population in, in, in cities. So at the same time that the Porto Maravilha, it's a totally global space, a totally uh, boring type of waterfront regeneration, we got this uniqueness. And this uniqueness, it's based on very small details. So it's based on a baobab, it's based on the local community, the the Pequena Africa, and also other, other places. So we try to use the heritage as a tool, a political tool, to change other uh, 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 possibilities to this kind of urban regeneration. Okay. So I think David, uh, right, David and then Tony, yeah. Uh, thank you all, all three of you, terrific presentations. And Kirk, for your question about where do monuments begin and end, I hadn't quite thought about it, that was, that was a great question. My question stems off Rodney's presentation, but it's really for all three of you. How do you think about tragedy in the public space? Um, Rodney, in your presentation, you said the three big themes were 
acknowledge tragedy, consider the legacy, lest we forget. And you talked about transcending tragedy. I found that reclining figure just stunning. <coughs> I've not yet been to that memorial, but I, I'm eager to go soon. Um, you know, tra tragedy is one of those ideas Americans don't even like to think about a lot. It's not a word we use a lot. Other cultures are a little better at it, perhaps. There are dozens of notions of tragedy, from the Greeks to the Bible to Shakespeare and so on and so on and so on. But this is a story of authentic tragedy, however we want to define it. Um, how do you think about that concept in these, as designers, as artists, in these kinds of contexts with these kinds of extraordinary memorials? Or is it not all that conscious? Do, at some point, do you have to just you know, put the concept behind and, and just go for the design? But at some point, how do you think about tragedy when you do this kind of work? I'm asking as a historian. I've written a lot about tragedy, but I usually you know, I rely on philosophers and people who write about it. And I don't have to design anything. <laughs> um, so, but you do. Uh, uh, how do you think about tragedy in the public space like this? Well, thank you for that question. That's um, that's one of the actually the, one of the biggest challenges in terms of uh, memorial design for dealing with a, a serious tragic episode in history like the transatlantic slave trade and slavery, and and there's a couple of, there are a couple of issues that we always have to confront in regards to that in terms of like uh, how does one you know in some cases essentially represent the tragedy without necessarily being a, a victim to it uh, and being a slave to it in terms of the design we, we always we try to uh, express in the design objectives early on um, an opportunity to acknowledge it but also an opportunity to transcend it in the context of memorialization, I mean, it, you know, this tragedy is part of like a continuum. So there's there's a component that we tend to be fixated on the present, I think. But and some people think of memorial as fixated on the past, but we see it as sort of part of a continuum of past, present, and future. So the design itself needs to, I think, transcend the tragedy in some ways. Uh, so that we see it as a kind of an aspect of the design having an interactive aspect where people can heal uh, beyond the acknowledgement because you know there's an idea that you know you need to acknowledge that because obviously historically you know there hasn't been an acknowledgement and I think that there also needs to be an, a point of reflection where you can then go beyond that acknowledgement and then begin to repair I think uh, there was a discussion about you know the term, <coughs> reclaiming the the, nerm, the, t the term reparations as what it really means to repair and to go beyond and to heal. So not to be really you know captured by the aspect of tragedy, but use it as part of a narrative, and and to kind of like a tell a story. And I think Americans like you know happy endings, right? So uh, I think there's an aspect of hope to that. Above the uh, the um, the door of return in the African burial ground is an adinkra symbol of hope. So the idea is that when you pass through, that you know, you're you're passing, and you're in a part of that continuum going towards the future, and that there's a hopeful future uh, in the acknowledgement and in the and in the transcendence that we look for. So um, it's kind of like a long response, but that's sort of like how we kind of well, approach I, it. And just a quick follow up. The, it is always fascinating, this, again, it's, it's kind of Kirk's question, where do monuments begin and end? It's always fascinating to think about which memorials, first of all, move us, and which, at which memorials do we actually experience some healing? I mean, we don't always know when that's happening. We might not know it till later. We might not know it till we're in a group. But some memorials do lend themselves to healing. They have. I mean, we, the Vietnam memorials are the famous one in America now. Uh, but there's so many others, uh, and I think just the process you all go through to get to that, because you don't know your end, and you're, you're putting this up and hoping. I think it's just absolutely fascinating how you use the imagination, and all of us who just, just write for a living, I think, have to keep learning from that. Thank you. And uh, Tony. Uh, th oh, thanks so much, Kirk. I um, really would like to thank all three of you for absolutely stimulating presentations. 
really, th thank you very much. Um, the, as I listened, I, the, the, something that struck me was that each of you were working through a set of intellectual and historical resources that were local or primarily African-based, or African-Brazilian, African-American, Afro-Haitian, Afro, -Haitian, Afro, uh, or, Afro or Caribbean. But that sent what you were all doing and designing were not necessarily things that were mirror of those things and of those sources, that there was a drawing from the sources. And so that there was a way in which, particularly in the Guadalupean case, I was thinking of a certain kind of abstraction to the design that you all did. And really wanted to talk about, you mentioned abstract, and really wanted to think about this question of not just the abstract, but the process of abstraction that comes from the sources, the rich sources of the African diasporic experience or the African experience. And I think of it because they, I, I'm working on an art project in Haiti. I met a young man in Jacmel. I looked at his work and I said, you're an abstract painter. And he looked at me and said, Prof, no because he was actually painting one of the lowers. And he says, no prof, I am an abstraction painter. And I kind of paused for a minute <laughs> and said, okay, explain that to me. And he talked about a particular process of using the lowers in the pantheon of Voodoo mm -hmm. to then begin to paint in a certain way. So I want to ask you a bit about that. And then secondly, for any one of you, but then secondly, I want to ask Leon specifically about the site <coughs> in Haiti. About the what? The site in Haiti oh, okay. that you ended with, mm -hmm. which then almost faded to black, right? It was up and then faded to black. And, I, and then you said, um, you know, you talked about a site of a memorialization a site of, uh, and a site of resistance. And I just wanted to know <coughs> what exactly you have in your mind uh, if you're going to do anything with that site or work with that site, what precisely do you have? Because that's, that's an extraordinary complicated site. And I just wanted to know, you know, what were your thoughts on it? But thank all three of you. I mean, I could, I guess, start with the second question first. And I guess the other question was directed at all of us. Uh, the, the site of, uh, that we ended up with was the Citadel, yeah. La Ferrier, which is, um, a fortification that was constructed uh, under the direction of Henri Christophe, who was uh, one of the generals of the Haitian liberation, who crowned himself emperor of Haiti eventually. Uh, but it's also uh, a structure that, uh, very monumental structure that was meant for the protection of the population um, for potential incursion, continued incursion by European powers. Uh, eventually, which never really transpired. And I think that uh, I've always found it fascinating that in, whenever I show that slide or when I talk about the Citadel, especially like the architects and other people that we should know about it, we don't know about it. So I tend to lately try to introduce that because I think it's um, a symbolic of not understanding or knowing uh, who we are and that we are in interconnected, and that there is this idea of memorialization also being an expression somehow of kind of like a tragedy, like we were talking about before, and victimhood. Whereas growing up from, uh, you know, Haitian American being first born generation Haitian, our relationship to history and to slavery specifically tends to be, when we, when we grow up, a, a little bit different in terms of like how we speak about slavery and how we. You see it because you know the the ability for of of liberation to be a part of also that history, but what I find kind of fascinating in terms of like the context of um, just a broader context and how we're connected, how Americans don't understand the relationship between 
you know, that, that transformation, that historic transformation that occurred with Haitian liberation, the impact that it had upon American, America's development. And, you know, if you understand the loss of and the defeat of Napoleon, the defeat of the British, the defeat of the Spanish, by Toussaint Louverture, Henri Christophe, Jean-Jacques de Saline, and you understand essentially that was the wealthiest source of, of income for the French Empire at the time, then you wouldn't have the Louisiana Purchase. You wouldn't have the westward expansion of the United States. And you wouldn't have the, essentially the development of the, this Western Hemisphere the way that we understand it to be. So in a lot of ways, I, ironically, you know, the United States owes a huge debt to Haiti <laughs> and African liberation, which is a context in context with the freedom that transformed this, this continent from, from British imperialism as well. So I like to, to, to include that site uh, in, you know, I think I'll probably do it more often in the context of presentations like this in order to start to get people to really start to expand and understand the relationship between slavery, liberation, and how that also can be inspirational and inspiring and transformational in regards to our own historic context here and stop to kind of put it in this kind of like a box that, you know, you know we, kind of, we tend to think about things. So I'll try to, to answer. Um, first, um, um, less is more. Um, that's why uh, on the project um, we don't have any heroes. How heroes are not there. They are into the, um, the, the memorial. But uh, because uh, uh, sometimes uh, when you evoke a symbol, you can just you know do an arc, and then uh, you can protect a place, and the place is uh, all those things uh, which are not represented. So it's a way uh, we want to do it uh, because. Uh, the roots are symbols. Mm. The granite is symbols. It's a tribute of uh, of this history. We 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 don't think in Guadeloupe. It's particularly because uh, uh, Guadeloupe don't think uh, about Africa. They don't think about the 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 traumatism of slavery. Uh, um, put uh, uh, um, coupure. Cut. It cut. It cut. It put a cut, you know, and then uh, um, uh, um, to to um, how how should you say that? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm going pour 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 faire accepter. Le memorial act à la population. So in order to have the uh, memorial be accepted by the population, nous avons dû uh, ruser avec la symbolique. We had to play with the, symb the, the symbolic. Et la, la rendre suggestive. And to make it suggestive. Et en même temps profonde. And also deep. Uh, C'est pour ça que uh, uh, nous ne pouvions pas traiter la tragédie. It's for this, the, for this reason that we couldn't treat the tragedy, we couldn't deal with the tragedy. Nous pouvions traiter que l'hommage aux disparus. We could only do the homage to the disappeared, those who disappeared. Car le choc était déjà immense de faire ce, ce, cette, cette, cet élément-là. Because the shock was already immense. Il y avait dans la population beaucoup d'avis différents. In the population there was many different opinions. Beaucoup de gens, comme je l'ai entendu hier et avant hier, disaient il faut oublier cette histoire-là et aller de l'avant. C'est pour ça que notre architecture symbolique dit tribute, il faut honorer nos ancêtres. It's for this that our symbolic architecture says that we must honor our ancestors. Mais il faut aussi connaître notre histoire pour aller vers le futur. But we also have to know our, um, our history in order to go towards the future. Et c'est pour ça que cette construction est nécessaire à notre progression. It is for this that this construction is necessary to our progression. Il faut effectivement reconnaître, euh, euh, il faut reconnaître, euh, il y a une, beaucoup de débats sur la reconnaissance de la mémoire. 
Mm -hmm. One has to recognize that there's lots of debates on the on the um, on the recognition of this memory. Anna, et, euh, et, et je pense que Glissant a dit que euh, c'est bien d'avoir de, un devoir de mémoire. Glissant a dit que c'est bien d'avoir un devoir de connaissance. Mais c'est mieux d'avoir un devoir de connaissance. But it's better to have a duty towards knowledge. Et c'est même mieux d'avoir un devoir de reconnaissance aux esclaves qui sont morts dans cette histoire. And it's even better to have um, a duty towards the recognition uh, of the slaves. C'est pour ça que nous basons notre architecture sur la, le fait que la boîte noire qui contient l'histoire qui est, qui est racontée de 1650 à nos jours. So it's for this reason that the black box that contains the story that uh, from, from when to when? Uh, 1650, 1630. Set from 1730 to our, to our time now. Voilà. C'est ça le bijou. That's the jewel. Mais parce que c'est ça qui fait des espaces de discussion et d'échange qui nous permettent de progresser tous ensemble puisque nous ne voulons pas faire fragments de société. So it's this box that allows us to have the space for discussion um, because we do not want to have the fragments of so to have society fragment. Voilà. Et donc l'essentiel le, est là. L'essentiel n'est pas de rappeler pour nous des territoires qui sont maintenant inconnus chez nous et qui reviennent et qui sont très bien montré dans l'exposition permanente. So it's for this that we don't want to um, recall territories that are unknown and that are part of our permanent ex exhibition. Qui sont très bien montrés à l'intérieur. Nous, no notre suggestion, c'est de d'emmener de, nos populations du, du passé qu'elles sont supposées connaître dans cette boîte noire vers le futur, vers l'avenir, d'où les racines d'argent. So it's first that we want to bring our populations from a past that they know that's contained in the black box towards a future, a future, um, a future. To future. Yeah. Voilà. So, je ne sais pas si j'ai bien répondu à la question, mais l'abstraction pour nous, elle, elle, est, euh, elle, elle nous permet de pouvoir euh, exprimer des choses et les exprimer de façon simple avec un langage très dépouillé et universel. So the abstraction allows us to express things simply with a language that is simple, that, but that is universal. And I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, <coughs> okay, so we have a question here. Yeah. Well, it's not a question. A I comment. speak as a chairman <laughs> uh, of this Memorial Act. One thing is that uh, um, you, mu you must uh, feel an, ex an experience is um, that this abstraction uh, is like, this m um, memorial act is like a work of art. I mean, it works on other um, uh, other parts of our intelligence. I mean, it's not just intellectual. It becomes, it becomes emotional, intellectual. Uh, it becomes visual. I mean, all the body is suddenly uh, connected because knowing of what it's about and because it's huge, suddenly uh, the point made by, by the public is maybe this history is important. And the building itself has the size of the crime that was committed. And for the tribute we must give to our ancestors. This is also the meaning for me, uh, who is external to the construction itself uh, of this building. It makes us, in terms of wondering, so but maybe it is not what I thought it was. These poor people, these um, slaves, were people and were great people. And it's change, it changes the, the, the um, per, uh, uh, perception, yes, uh, of, um, of, the, of, the, of the descendants of this history and make everybody think about it collectively also. It's not, and as Pascal said, it's not going to separate, create a, um, 
um, to, to, to split uh, the population again and again and again. It is make us think collectively about what we're talking about. And this is uh, one of the success of, um, of, the, of, the, of the building and the architecture. Last thing I'd like to say, uh, I was in a restaurant and the waiter uh, of the restaurant came and he recognized me and said, oh, uh, you know, uh, I was with my friends uh, and, I, and I went uh, to the Memorial Act and, and you know, it was great experience and when I went out my friends told me because they didn't want to come in, they were afraid of what they were going to find inside. So they, they refused, they waited for me outside on the, on this, under the arch. And when I came out, they said, uh, uh, wh wh so what is, what is it, how is it inside? And he answered them, oh, I, I can't tell you, I'm very moved. And you know, the, of course the building is beautiful, but the truth is inside. Mm -hmm. And I said, thank you, Mr. Waiter. <laughs> because this is exactly what this project is about and what, how it works. I mean, it's an it's, uh, invitation, it's an, um, 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 an homage, a tribute, but it's also educating knowledge and trying to reach, to touch something that we have not been educated and, and used to, to touch and to feel about our history and this history. I wonder if I might, um, if I might just jump in and then we'll have one last question after that. Um, I wanted to ask, actually ask a follow-up question to Tony's about the abstraction, because one of the things that uh, Pascal, that, that, um, that was new to me from the presentation was the Madras fabric, which was so striking, and, and your window design is an abstraction of that Madras fabric. And my, my particular question here is uh, how that relates to the Indian diaspora in the diaspora from India in the Caribbean and in Guadeloupe and how the building has connected with that particular population has it I mean and is that Madras is that Madras um, motif uh, recognized by um, you know Indians who visit uh, is that something that draws them in is it is it is it something that actually creates a connection with with those that particular type of visitor? No, <laughs> it's, it's abstraction. <laughs> um, I try to explain, and uh, you know, when they come, um, because uh, um, we have uh, the Diwali. Uh, Diwali is a, a ceremony, Indian ceremony, and he used to, they make it uh, twice in the memorial. And when the Indian community, uh, um, come, uh, I say, oh, look, come on, uh, you see, uh, <laughs> you see, you see, you say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we don't reach to the goal any time. We try, perhaps you fall, perhaps you win. So we had one last question back here, yeah. I'm, uh, hello? Uh, the, the images of the various memorials that you've been talking about are, are, are staggering and, and I hope that I live long enough to be able to visit them and experience them firsthand. But I'm, I'm struck with uh, what Mr. Bonder said a little while ago when he said that the significance of a memorial is, really goes beyond scale. And uh, the, the thing that I hope you will do before you leave today, uh, the campus, is to take on a very small scale memorial that Brown has in front of its university hall across the street. And it, to me, um, when I visit the campus, I experience the power of that very small memorial. Uh, when I grab a hold of the iron link, it's a broken chain. And, and I feel something that comes from the ground, which is it, it's rooted in. And, it, and then it, it makes me look up on top of the broken chain and there's a little mirror there that reflects the sky. And I think it's all, all of that is what is to me a very powerful statement in a very small space.
Well, let's see. I think we, um, we're at 357. <laughs> if there are, uh, and there's one. OK. So we do have time for one more question right here next to it. OK. Thank you. Um, I'm just bowled over by what we saw today. So I just want to thank the entire panel. Um, I think that with these memorials, there is so much power, intelligence, and, and craft, too. Um, and I think one question I had, um, which is really about uh, so many things happening at once. Um, I think that you know some people are talking about the, the fact that memorials pay tribute, but they are also places of healing, but they are also places of warning. Three very different things. Um, I think scale was something that I wanted to point to, the difference in scale of all these projects and how you have all dealt with this, the scale, the space that you're given, but are trying to tell a much bigger story. So there's always that tension, I think, of scale. Um, and then also, always in architecture, this tension between representation and experience. Giving someone, telling someone a story about a thing and trying to convey an experience of a thing. Um, and I feel like all of these projects did all of those pieces um, so beautifully. So what I'm wondering is, I'm just wondering if you would share with us some of your inspirations, because uh, I, I agree with um, Kirk Savage, who started this by saying, the memorial in some ways feels like it really has not been a medium that has been pushed to the, the extent that you are all pushing it, um, taking it in new directions, making it a very much of a living experience. So I'm wondering in all of these projects, who you possibly look to as inspiration points, whether within architectural history, landscape, or even outside of the fields to literature, <coughs> um, just to kind of share that with us. I think um, <clears throat> from the standpoint of, of the work that we've done, that um, a lot of what we're looking for is uh, inspiration, not necessarily from, let's say, a, a particular architect or a particular memorial per se, in, as much as it is um, the way that people, let's say from a, let's say a, tr a, a traditional uh, standpoint, if you think about African space, um, interact. And if you, if you go back and look at the, the classical idea of a memorial as a, as a place that you kind of stand back from and that you, you visually look at or look up to, and it's not meant for to be really something that you interact with or connect with in, in, in any way other than visually. And then if you start to think about memorials as primarily being interactive and something that you connect with and something that a place that you really create activity and, and, and connections between people, then once people leave, the idea is that that experience has kind of transformed them. So they take that experience with them and then it's sort of like they take that lesson and they take that uh, sensibility about what they experience where they're at the memorial someplace else. And so those are the things that we, we look for in terms of like inspiration, those types of spaces, those types of places. In the case of the African burial ground, you know, ideas of uh, uh, the traditional African um, courtyard space that might have uh, an inkisi, I don't know if you're familiar with the, those kind of figures, or an ancestral pillar. And, and, and this is an, an object which is activated through physical action and interaction and ritual. Mm -hmm and we're looking for those types of rituals, those types of actions and interactions to really bring life to this space. So trying to also introduce multiple uh, mediums of communication uh, and within the memorial, so you know, we'll have like words, uh, phrases, uh, we'll have maps, we'll have formal spaces, we'll have landscaping, so that you have multiple sensory interactions and perceptions and and that makes, I think, the experience much more transformative and a lot more of a multiplicity of experiences as opposed to kind of a singularity. And another thing is that we also look at the, the aspect of dealing with the contradictions that you, you're going to need individuals to have a certain experience, uh, small groups, but also in the context of an urban environment, this whole idea of like ceremony. So how do you, with a very limited amount of space, begin to address the, the potential for reflection on an individual scale, but at the same time accommodate uh, teaching and communication? Because education, I think, is essentially like the primary aspect of it. And the more interactive it is, the, the better it would be to teach children 
and to transmit the knowledge that needs to be transmitted. But also there's an idea of like ceremony and the impact of ceremony and ritual in the context of like how we as people, as a, na as a nation kind of like have celebrations and uh, have holidays. How do you then begin to also allow larger groups of people to kind of like on an urban scale start to gather around and use this space as a backdrop for an acknowledgement of the significance of the site and of the history behind the site. So we're always thinking about you know those three complementary but often contradictory uh, aspects that we need to address. And and you know the, the inspiration comes from different sources. It doesn't necessarily for us come from one particular say, architect or project. So. So I think we're we're running a little bit over time. We will give the last word. Oh, okay. <laughs> Juste dire que pour pour le cas d'une compétition d'un concours d'architecture. So in the case of a competition of architecture. Le, il y a tout d'abord un programme. There's, a, there's first there's a program. Nous arrivons après une première réflexion. After there's you have the first reflections. The first so thoughts. le le cadre en général est donné. So the parameters are done, are, are given. Et l'inspiration de l'architecte porte sur l'organisation. And the inspiration of the architect comes from that, with those parameters. Et sur les intentions and de and of the, on architecturales the, the architectural intentions sur la traduction des abstractions. Of the translation of the abstractions. Okay, and we'll a final word here to Sarah, and then we will um, let you go for a break. Um, you know, I mentioned this briefly in the beginning of my presentation, but um, you know, architecture is severely lacking in literature and practice that's rooted in African spatial tradition. Um, and so what a lot of you are sensing in terms of how lengthy of a process that we've all gone through is required. You know, um, A lot of projects, um, and this has been referenced in a number of the questions, you know, memorials are, they have the potential to, to default into symbols and recreation, um, and preservation, you know, only preservation, recreation, and then just symbols. I, I can't tell you how many times I was asked to put African symbols somewhere, you know? And it's, you know, this is sort of like default thinking when really what we should be doing is creating spatial experience. Um, there, are, there are distinct spatial experiences that are related to this culture and to this history. Um, and and for me, you know, whether it be specifically about this history, but in general and about design, I think it's, it's important. And the, the burden is on us as designers to really tap into that. There, as, as Julia mentioned yesterday, there is a spatiality to memory and, and to tragedy. Um, and so, you know, as a designer, I don't see my role to, to come to any project or to any situation with a, a predetermined idea about what tragedy is. Um, the first time that I presented the, the archaeological site idea to a, a panel of architects, you know, they asked me, where is the rage? Where, where is the anger? And um, I, I said, you know, don't ask me. That's not, it's not me. That, and um, I think that the emotions um, tied to this particular history, you know, it, it's not something like a war in that it's something outside of the everyday. You know, descendants of this history wake up every day and deal with it. So you can't wake up every day and feel rage. Um, so how do, you, how do you interface with this history every day? It's a different emotion and therefore it's a different spatial typology. And so, you know, designers that work in this realm have a huge task of starting from scratch in a lot of ways. You know, we can't draw from precedents. Um, so the inspiration, in my mind, has, has to almost you know, be reconstructed in, in, every, in every case. Well, thank you so much for a great discussion.